Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and today I'm speaking with a name familiar to PeakProsperity.com readers, Gregor McDonald, who joins me to talk about energy, specifically net energy, what's left over after you've expended the effort to obtain it. And we're going to talk about a lot of the recent reports that have just been coming out from the IEA, the EIA, from BP, from Citigroup, from all these groups saying that we have apparently unlocked a new energy resource and we're headed into a new age of energy abundance. We really need to talk about that because guess what? The devil is in the details. I think we both happen to believe that current data supports the view that the economic model based on ever increasing quantities of fossil liquid fuels is coming to an end, whether we want it to or not. We're going to discuss the whys of that, the implications of it, and what model or models are likely to replace it. So, Gregor, I'm really I'm glad to finally have you on as a podcast guest. Hey, it's great to it's great to talk with you uh, from my home here in in Portland, Oregon. As some of our readers may know, you and I used to be neighbors in Western Massachusetts, and uh, I certainly miss many aspects of Western Massachusetts, but I just love being here in in Portland. And besides, I've got you holding down the holding down the fort there back in Western Mass anyway. So um, good to talk with you today. Well, I, I miss Portland. I lived there for three years of my life in the Southwest District uh, over near Lewis and Clark College. Loved living there. You can grow anything, anything there. And I, I loved, uh, loved that as an early inept gardener. That was a great place to get started. It is a wonderful place. Uh, we have not started uh, growing yet, but you, you sort of get the bountifulness of local agriculture through all the local farmers markets here. So that's been, that's been quite a nice aspect of our life here since we, since we arrived. Well, I'm, I'm jealous of that part of it. Now, uh, here we are in 2013. I, I would love for you to give our listeners, many of whom have been reading your work on our site for some time now, just a little bit of a background into how you developed your expertise on the energy markets. Yeah, so when I returned um, to the United States at the beginning of the uh, last decade, I returned 1999-2000, um, I started trading and investing for myself in the stock market. And I, I you know, I did the typical route where I, I used shares of common stock and I also used uh, stock options. And, you know, I'd spent several years outside of the country uh, at that point, both in London, England, and in Wellington, New Zealand. And I'd returned sort of with a fresh interest in currencies and different currencies uh, and also different sort of cultural perspectives on, on value. And I guess through through some of that international experience, I also got very interested um, in oil because you may recall this was during the period of time when oil went into its all-time historic low. It was down around 15, uh, 14, 15 dollars a barrel, and there were a lot of declarations that oil would be cheap for the a decade. There'd be a, there was the famous Economist uh, cover, you know, just drowning in oil. I think was the famous cover. And I, when I returned to the States, I was fascinated with the relationship between the dollar and oil. And, and that was all I knew, Chris. I, I just thought the dollar is so strong for a country that doesn't produce much oil. And here's oil, this sort of miracle substance, which is so cheap. And, of course, at that time, everyone was in love with, you know, technology stocks, Intel, Juniper Networks, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so forth. So I started trading for my own account. And what I realized quickly, as every trader realizes, is that all you're really doing is information arbitrage when you're trading. You're basically trying to gather just a little bit more knowledge um, for yourself than the market knows about and trading out ahead of that and seeing if you can exploit that knowledge. And I found that it was astonishingly easy to start to gather knowledge about um, energy and the energy sector because it was a sector that no one was interested in. <laughs> I mean, like I say, everyone was very wrapped up in uh, in technology. So 
as I moved into my time where I was trading and also beginning to write about the economy just for myself, not for any sort of publication, I began to realize there was this whole universe of information about global energy markets. There was, you could get free data from governments about what global oil production was and you could get all sorts of historical data about prices and you could research companies and find out how much oil they were sitting on and I just, I just felt like I, I, I I just felt like I was bounding through, you know, a garden of delights of all this wonderful information. And I would look at the prices in the markets and I would think to myself, my gosh, very little of this is reflected in, in prices. So that was a very kind of exciting time for me, that 2000 to 2005, 2006 period, because that's really when oil began to go through its price revolution. Mm -hmm. And everyone was baffled, thought it couldn't happen, thought it was the strangest thing they'd ever seen in their life. Oil at $30 a barrel, what are you talking about? You know, I remember seeing people come on Bloomberg Television and CNBC in 2003 and 2004 and all sorts of old veteran analysts saying, gosh, if oil ever got to $40 a barrel, which we don't think it will, you know, the big companies will pump so much oil, they'll just knock oil back down to 30 or $25 a barrel. So it was really, um, I think, my international experience and then coming back to the States and sort of taking an interest in what seemed like a boring, you know, sort of lifeless, uninteresting area um, that sort of got me... Um, sort of got me down the rabbit hole, if you will, of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, becoming an energy researcher. And there's more I could say about this, because, you know, what comes after this period is my discovery that there was even more data and more information out there that could be had for free that people were not paying attention to. And I guess, uh, I guess what surprises me today, Chris, is that even today, you know, 10, 12 years later after this experience, there's still a lot of data and information out there that people are not using. Um, that could be really useful. A lot of it's free. Um, it can be difficult to access, but there's a, there continues to be a mismatch between what the media says about what's happening in energy or what the market says about what's happening in energy and what is, in fact, happening. So I'm surprised that the information arbitrage opportunity still hasn't completely gone away. Well, it's interesting you say that, and I remember back, too, when uh, oil hit $40 a barrel, very famously, uh, I think it was Greenspan at the time, said uh, it's transiently, you know, just going to be at 40 meaning he thought it would just transiently stick at 40 for a bit and then go back down again. That was the expectation of a wide range of people who weren't, I think, looking at the base data the way you were, the way I was. It, the base data was clearly saying that, uh, there were huge new entrants on the demand side that supplies were becoming deeper, trickier, more remote, uh, less fruitful than prior discoveries. So there were a variety of things pushing on this story. And Greenspan proved was proved to be right. Oil did transit right through 40 and never looked back and never touched it again. And here we are with world oil at $110 a barrel. And I have to say that that's sending a pretty important price signal to me at least and it's just simply saying the cheap oil's over. And yet we have these extraordinary new sets of reports coming out. And, and I love that you, you mentioned and referenced the dot com pieces because as I, as I push through these reports, I'm starting to get that uncomfortable feeling I had when I was reading about the dot com stories in the heyday and also the housing bubble. That there's a certain mentality that takes over and it's dominated by seeing similar phraseology, similar straight line ruler extrapolations of current trends forever into the future, um, a dropping of the guard, a lack of skepticism, uh, the, the wholesale sort of adoption of the most rosy articulations of, of the narrative. And so this is in the IEA reports that, that came out, uh, the EIA, Citigroup, now most recently BP. They, they've all released these reports that show that, um, to just pick on one aspect of this, that tight oil, this is what people are calling shale oils. We're more, more correctly going to start referring to it as tight oil to hopefully differentiate it from oil shale so we can avoid that confusion. This tight oil sits in a variety of rock structures and, you know, it's the Bakken is one example of that. Eagleford's another. All of these reports have just basically ramped up its production from here to somewhere between three and as high as six million barrels per day in the case of the BP report. 
And, and and then it just magically stays there as a permanent feature of the future. What are your views on this? Well, in the uh, menu of, of logical fallacies, uh, <laughs> you know, one of my favorites is the fallacy of composition. Uh-huh. And that is we all engage in a little fallacy of, of composition. We uh, wake up in the morning, we uh, stretch our arms, we get out, we look... We look out the window of our own neighborhood, everything seems peaceful and uh, harmonious, and we say, well, if it's peaceful and harmonious on my little street here, it must be peaceful and harmonious everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, of course, that's not the case. Well, what's happened is that there is new oil production in the United States, and, of course, the United States happens to be a country where which is a center of, of global, you know, of global media. So we've got a fallacy of composition story here, which is simply that because the United States has, has, has temporarily reversed a long, uh, multi-decade decline in its own oil production by accessing new oil resources, that somehow we can build this story up to apply to the rest of the world. Let me just say two brief things, um, about this. Number one, it's, known, it was always known that the U.S. had other oil resources that were more expensive and and could be extracted. I mean, California offshore oil has been there for um, a number of decades, ready to be extracted if anyone wanted to take the risk, the environmental risk, or undertake the costs. Um, It's not you know, shocking that we would develop, you know, some new extraction techniques to get into this tight oil here in the United States. What it hasn't changed, um, however, is is the whole, you know, that we can't really build this up to, to change the, it doesn't really knock the trajectory of global oil production uh, much in any particular direction because we're really just looking at a, currently a worldwide increase of maybe about a little bit more than one and a half percent of global oil production after being trapped around the ceiling since 2004 to 2005. We have seen a a slight increase of of global oil production, but it's actually not. Here's the funny thing, Chris. It's actually not because of United States oil. I mean, this is sort of the this is sort of the cruel the cruel joke. What's the United States sits within non OPEC production, okay, and then you know OPEC has its production, non OPEC has its production. Yes, the United States has increased its oil production, but the rest of non-OPEC has continued to see declines. Hmm. So when we look at the recent uptick in worldwide oil production over the past 10 to 12 months, is it because of non-OPEC and this new oil coming out of the United States? (laughs) No, it's not. It's because of uh, OPEC finally has managed to increase a little bit of its production. Many countries in non-OPEC continue to struggle uh, just massively with uh, oil declines in their production or just stagnation. So again, this is uh, this is a, a wonderful economic story for the people of North Dakota and other tight oil regions, but it 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 hasn't changed the whole. So fallacy of composition, media can push that story for as long as they can or until people figure figure this one out. I, there's one way for people to figure out the fallacy of composition, and that's the fact that the price of oil is not going down. Well, there is that that stubborn little factoid that sits out there. And even with this recent worldwide uh, bump up in oil, it, it's fairly minor as I look at it. So the world since 2004, if you use that as a reference point, or 2005, bumping along in a band between 72 and 76 million barrels per day. It's about a 5% band. And that's with all of these recent uh, advances in, in U.S. tight oil production. That's with uh, worldwide capital spending in 2012 being a little over $600 billion on new oil exploration and, and uh, production projects. It's an extraordinary rate of spend. It's the highest ever, of course. And when you're spending a little over a half trillion to basically nudge along in a 5% band, I think this should be sending warning signals to anybody who just looks at the data, even at that macro level, uh, there's a lot of details we could go into and take it all the way to the field by field basis. But when you're spending more than a half trillion to bump along in a band, what should we take from that? Well, I think uh, your recent essay shows that we've doubled the global spend on extraction and production. Have I got that mm-hmm. correct in yep. the past 10 years? And then, of course, 
oil, the oil price itself went through a price revolution in which you could say it really quadrupled. I, I think really the right place to begin this is $25 a, dollars a barrel. Mm -hmm. And we've now successfully repriced to an average of $100 a barrel. That, that repricing, again, let's just review. Many people said that repricing could never happen. They're now silent. Many people said that if it happened, it would be given back. They, uh, too, have fallen silent on that, on that prediction. Uh, what's clear is that the repricing not only took place, but it has been maintained. It's kept. We're, we're not going back to, to cheap oil. So we've had this extraordinary price revolution in the commodity itself. We've had uh, tremendous inf cost inflation. And for all of that, we've got maybe an extra 1.5% of supply. If you use like 74 million barrels a day, I think we're currently producing 75 and a half million barrels a day. We were trapped at that ceiling of 74 million days for about seven years, and we've just poked our head above that. But again, this is recent poking above uh, above that level. So, um, gosh, I mean, even to the layman, it should be kind of obvious that there's <laughs> That there's um, that the nature of this resource known as oil um, has under has undergone you know kind of a, a very dramatic phase transition and it's not a not a surprise you know we're we're a century into the oil age um, and uh, you know we're we're in the back half um, of global of global resources and uh, the easy oil um, was extracted first and that's always the case with any, you know, sort of natural resource. So this current spate of media stories, uh, even uh, this week, uh, the release of the BP uh, outlook, which, again, uh, you and I talked about, is echoing this story of plenty. Um, I just chuckle because even in some of these glowing uh, reports, you get down into the details and they say, oh, by the way, um, as optimistic as we are about all these new resources that are coming online, they're really not going to change the trajectory of the existing declines from the existing fields. So um, it, within the body of some of these reports, you, you do get uh, some refreshing sobriety, um, some acknowledgement that, uh, you know, between now and 2020, what we wind up net in terms of gains, you know, we can be all excited about tight oil, but what do we wind up in terms of a net gain into global oil production? Maybe not much. Well, it was interesting also in, in that report I wrote that all these recent forecasts, the BP one you mentioned goes out to 2030. And, and yes, we might get 6 million barrels per day coming out of tight oil if all goes according to plan. And then we have to hold that up against the, the four, five percent decline rates in existing fields, which translates into roughly 40 to 50 million barrels per day of lost production out of those between here and 2030. And now we just have to sort of wave our thumbs around and go, maybe 6 million on the plus side. We're offsetting that against this uh, 40, 50 million barrel decline on the other side. And this is exactly kind of where most, I think, uh, uh, I would say rational predictors of the peak oil phase had been saying. I, Colin Campbell was talking about this a long time ago, that you don't just hit a peak and fall off, that the world is probably going to bump along a plateau. A lot of data is really consistent with the idea that we're, yeah, we're bumping along a plateau. Yeah, there's this extraordinary stuff going on with, with, uh, new technologies and it's, it's really quite amazing. But the part I really want to talk to you about though is that, is that the details are really where the story resides. And yet to get to the details, you have to break the components apart and look at them. And as you and I have talked about in the past, uh, they're actually, they being most of the, these major reports are starting to lump things back together. There's two big buckets of that. The first one I want to talk about is, um, let's start here because this one got the most airplay. The U S is going to surpass Saudi Arabia in oil output potentially by 2020. What, what do we have to believe um, that this involves a lumping of sorts that I think we have to tease back apart. What's getting lumped in there? Well, t this is taking any sort of energy source that could vaguely be regarded as a liquid and throwing it throwing it into the same container and saying look look what you know look what we look what we've built uh here so um you know currently while it's true that Saudi Arabia probably produces some 
natural gas liquids, the really the best comparison on an energy basis uh, when looking at these two uh, global oil producers, the United States and Saudi Arabia, is just to look at the production of crude oil. And, and fine, crude oil from conventional production, crude oil from unconventional production, but at least restrict the comparison to crude oil because, of course, each barrel of crude oil has about 5.7 million BTU. You can think of that as roughly 6 gigajoules of energy. But each barrel of natural gas liquids only has two thirds of that amount in in energy. It you know call that four gigajoules of of energy. So the United States has seen extraordinary growth in natural gas liquids, and this is known as obfuscation by complexity. Hmm. When you basically take a lot of different types of substances or take a lot of complex factors and lump them all to together just to come up with some sort of headline number. And um, I think for the United States to, quote, achieve a headline of becoming a greater liquids producer than Saudi Arabia by 2020, you have to add up all our oil and you have to add up all the natural gas liquids, which, as I mentioned, only have two-thirds of the energy content, heat content. And then you start throwing in things like biofuels, which it's hard to evaluate the energy content of biofuels because um of course they're really just energy inputs from other from other sources but but your original feedstock which is generally corn it it has so little energy content compared to a comparable unit of a a fossil fuel that it it's almost hard to compare it's almost hard to see it's it's almost a microscopic amount of uh, energy content so it's quite silly or disingenuous whatever you want to call it to lump all this together The bottom line, Chris, is that the U.S. is not close now, nor is it likely to become close to to Saudi Arabia in oil production. And again, that's even you know fine. Add all the quote unconventional production. I don't. We don't have to accept that out. If it's oil, it's oil. Even if it costs more to extract it, um, you know, just make that the the comparison. But unfortunately, the public um, doesn't understand this complexity so they get fed a story um that's just composed of the headlines well it's it's startling to me that that we have to then try and decompose these things because i uh, the story of oil for me has always been a story of transportation fuels that's why i personally care about oil because we live in a global just-in-time society our economy any economy is highly dependent on transporting things from point a to point b and if we could transport things from point A to point B with these natural plant gas liquids, which would be things like ethane and propane and butane, uh, pentane, these are useful substances. And from an, a manufacturing or an industrial standpoint, you can get as excited as you want to about those because they're important feedstocks for plastics, fertilizers, and 500,000 consumer goods. But what they're not useful for is putting into into fuel tanks and driving around with them. So so what we in this story the United States still imports an extraordinary amount of transportation fuels and then yeah we've been drilling these wells and we've been getting a lot of these natural uh plant gas liquids which are again nice but to lump them in is to, is to say you know it's like to have batteries uh and ice cream in your house and to say this is how many calories I've got in my house. They're just they're not really comparable forms of energy or sources of energy. And so I've, I've been confused by that lumping. And so uh, here it's important to say, really, what do we have? Uh, we've got some important industrial feedstocks. That's a different story, though, than saying we're about to surpass Saudi Arabia, who principally just pumps out transportation liquid fuels in the form of, of all their different grades of petroleum they've got. So that was my that was my first confusion as to why we were suddenly comparing what felt to me a little bit like apples and oranges. Yeah, and I think the I think the American public must must be feeling fairly confused at this point because it's been treated to a storyline over the past twelve to fifteen months about an increase in U.S. production and how bountiful and how wonderful it is. But it but but this increase in production never translates into lower lower gasoline prices. Uh, meanwhile, since the peak of two thousand five six seven of oil consumption here in the United States. Americans have taken off at least 10, if not 12, and possibly even 14% of their consumption 
of oil. And we've seen a similar decline in consumption of oil in Europe. And, uh, you know, this is sort of, this is sort of the way the grim reaper of price basically frees up supply to send it to a different part of the world where, where the higher priced oil can, can be afforded because we, we have been essentially operating in a, in a zero sum game. So this, uh, increased production of liquids in the United States and, uh, natural gas liquids, it's actually had some benefits in terms of our manufacturing. We've, we continue to see some, some feel good stories about either the return of uh, manufacturing to the United States or the retention of existing manufacturing in the United States because we've got cheap electricity and we've got some good priced um, chemical uh, feedstocks for, you know, the chemical and other uh, industrial activities. That's all, that's all good. But um, none of this has changed the trajectory of what's happening in U.S. automobile uh, transportation, which, of course, was such a big part of American culture and the American economic story since World War I. You know, that's been such a huge uh, part of our um, identity and, and our economic growth and our, and our consumption rates. This little bounty of tight oil isn't really changing that at all. Well, it's uh, the fallacy of composition is sort of extended out. There's there's this remarkable dropping of context that I've seen where the idea that because the United States is going to produce more of its own oil, that this somehow is is isolated from the fact that the United States is still a global member of a global supply chain that that exists out there. And even if we're only importing 10% of our oil at some point in the future, which I will never get to, we're at about 40%. If we can get that in half to 20%, I think that would be a surprise. Uh, but if, even if we got there, we're still importing a fifth of our oil. And that oil, of course, is competed for on an international stage. And when we cast our eyes over to India and China in particular, their share, their their desire to, to increase their consumption has been just breathtaking over the past 10 years and not just for oil but for all forms of energy it's just it's a startling sort of a a trajectory and i think we have to be willing to suspend um a certain amount of of skepticism as it were in order to have the energy story be as rosy as it's been painted going forward we have to believe that china and india are going to curtail their consumption by some means other than price rationing and we have to believe that uh, the United States is going to be able to reinvigorate itself economically with lower energy consumption in the form of oil, which is not in uh, a really we can't we don't have any good data for that in the data series so far. But we have to believe that that's gonna that's gonna be true, and we have to believe that the recent experience in our first probes at tight oil are going to continue to be just as successful going forward, meaning that, you know, we haven't accidentally hit all the good sweet spots early and there's just plenty of acreage and we don't run out of either sweet spots or acreage or capital in this story. So all of these things have to be true. So for a minute, let's suspend all our disbeliefs that you and I might have. Even if all of that's true, what should we, what are we not doing as a nation with this story? Even if we have all this energy abundance out there, shouldn't we really be thinking about other things like someday oil and, and fossil fuels have to run out because they're finite resources. Wouldn't this, isn't there some massive reconfiguration of our energy landscape, our infrastructure, our operating business that we would have to really get to? And I know you've written about this with respect to the electrical grid, but what is it that we're not having as a conversation be, with these stories about how abundant we seem to be? I think the main conversation we're not having, Chris, is that wages are very unlikely to ever return to a relationship to energy costs that would make the United States economy into a happy, you know, sort of economic story once again. In other words, this whole idea that we will restore that, that unique relationship of high wages and low energy prices that's what we're not dealing with. So by by telling ourselves a story that we're producing more energy, you can clearly see the cultural impulse there. The cultural impulse is there is to suggest, see, th there's a chance, there's a chance, there's a chance we can get the energy costs down again, and then there's a chance, there's a chance, there's a chance that the wages will, will come up again. That relationship got, you know, very skewed 
and 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 sort of kicked into sort of a nasty bad place over the past decade that's very much a way of thinking about what what our economic story is why we had the crisis and why this supposed emergence from the crisis that we've been plodding our way through the past several years why it feels so dis- dissatisfactory why it feels so um insufficient in many in many respects so i think that's what we're not i think that's what we're not dealing with we're we're not dealing with sort of both variables because as you and i know widely available widely available and cheap energy almost always appears with high wages okay because for obvious mm-hmm. reasons i mean this this goes back to the industrial revolution what caused a revolution in british wages the the appearance of coal in the in the british economy why is that because not only did you have human workers making stuff but now you had coal helping you make stuff coal was the the slave labor that you didn't have to feed or shelter or clothe or house and you could get coal to work for you and you could work for you and you put it all together and it becomes high wages and you get to pocket those high wages so it's you know this is the this is the the dream that we once enjoyed you know this is the dream that we once enjoyed here in the states with our cheap oil and our high wages and and since oil became less cheap the wages have have stagnated and i just don't see how we're ever going to get back to that relationship again even you know maybe we'll talk about this i i do have some hope that a we could stabilize the relationship in a future world which is more weighted towards the power grid in which some manufacturing returns to the united states but i think the main thing you asked the question what's the main thing we're avoiding we're avoiding the the very painful prospect likelihood that we won't be able to return to high wages and low prices cheap energy you know there's a a third piece in that which for me is that around the type of uh economic and financial systems we we put in play around those high wages cheap energy uh landscape that you've articulated and that is debts that are constantly increasing at really profound rates, much faster than underlying economy taken as a total. When we take the articulation of the economy being GDP and we discount that a little bit because there's a lot of financial trickery in there and raw statistical fudgery. So if we say the true productive economy sitting under there, we were piling extraordinary amounts of debt on top of the productive economy, which itself is a derivative of cheap energy. And so when I look at this, what really the articulation, I think that that is the subtext behind all of these reports trying to say, listen, there's abundant energy and we can just get back to how things were. I totally understand why people would uh, naturally and intuitively and thankfully sort of flock to that message saying this means, A, we don't have to change and B, we can get back to how things used to be. Um, and we want rising wages, easy lifestyles. We want all of that. If that's if we can get back to that, I understand why naturally people would want to go there. The risk, however, is being articulated in this podcast is that maybe we can't. And we should at least start allowing a little bit of daylight into the conversation to say, what if what if $90 a barrel oil is what we need in order to viably prosecute these shale plays? And $90 a barrel oil is not compatible with the old way of racking up debts faster and faster and everybody being able to share in those spoils in the form, we would detect that in the form of higher wages, generally across the middle class, That's that narrative is really breaking down. And so I see many of these reports as sort of last gasp efforts to convince ourselves that we're not an aging starlet uh, when we look in the mirror. We are actually still pretty attractive. Yes, well, as you point out, one of the cruel things that we left in the wake of, of our higher rate of growth and our cheap energy era and our high wage era was, was the debt. We, we left a, a tremendous amount of, of debt, and of course there's the public debt. But I really think what's been governing the economy in the post-crisis area has been the, just sort of the intractable nature of the private debt. And, you know, I'm sure you know, we've both done work on charting the course of the private debt. I'm sure we'd agree that there has been some 
deleveraging that has occurred, but it's not nearly the amount of deleveraging that the media uh, either thanks or wishes uh, ha- has occurred. It really, when you compare private debt levels to uh, assets in the United States, yes, we're off the peak, but we're we're only back to 2006 levels, which is, <laughs> I mean, I remember living in 2006 and didn't know what it was like to live in 2007 or 2010 or 2012, and I was worried about debt levels in 2006, and most of the people I knew were worried about debt levels in 2006. So to, quote, deleverage back to 2006 levels is, uh, it, if you've been around for 10 years, it, it, it's not an achievement. <laughs> and, um, again, just as you're saying, this promise of, of greater energy supply, uh, is obviously dangling out, you know, the prospect that, that somehow that will translate into cheaper prices and that the debt can be serviced and possibly extinguished or, or, or deleveraged. But as, as we're finding, the process is grindingly slow. And because it's grindingly slow, that's a big reason why the economy is grindingly slow and just doesn't seem to make much progress. Well, my prediction is it, it will continue to sort of struggle along, at least by using uh, old tricks and conventional measures, because, you know, it's it, the net energy story is really the story here that, that needs to be told, because uh, it's not like the net energy story immediately shifts, but it's it's a rather complicated integral where, where two things are happening. We are depleting the Gawar fields and the other major conventional finds, which had extraordinary net energy returns, and into that mix of slowly diminishing conventional oil, we're starting to pump in more and more of this unconventional oil, like the tar sands, you know. And all you have to do is look at a tar sands operation to understand it is not remotely comparable to a, a, a conventional oil field. And we're getting net energy returns of 3 to 1, 5 to 1, depending on who's doing the counting off of that. And it's my our supposition, my, my theory, that we just can't possibly enjoy the same dynamics in interplays between these other variables, which are ever-increasing debt levels at far faster rates than than economic growth with um, these uneven distributions across the global landscape in terms of who's producing, who's consuming, goods, energy, all of those pieces, money, and and start feeding in these lower net energy sources and expect things to work quite right. It's it's It'd be a little bit like taking your uh, Ferrari, which has a very special fuel blend it requires, and slowly starting to put, you know, a little bit of kerosene in with your with your highly refined uh, high pentane mix. It just doesn't seem like it's going to work quite right. <laughs> well, these things can work for a short period in, in the short term, and that's sort of what we've been, that's sort of what we've been been doing in the last five to seven years. We've been adding either expensive or marginal uh, sources to the liquid fuel supply, as you know. And this process can be thought of as one where the older, more cheap oil is continually swapped out for the more expensive, less con- unconventional, more expensive oil. And that makes for some sort of new risks I think, when it comes to how the economy or the global economy may slow or speed up and what it may do to oil prices. Because what, what I think we're going to find, especially in, in resource plays like the, the tight oil resource plays, um, some of my recent research and discussions with colleagues about the tight, tight oil uh, plays is that if price goes below cost, what it what it's costing these companies to extract this oil it's actually going to be quite easy for these companies to simply stop drilling to stop adding additional wells because if you look at the actual mechanics by which wells are currently being added they're added on a highly discretionary basis they go in they produce a lot of oil for a short period of time and and then they go into steep they go into steep steep decline. I think what people don't understand is that the Bakken is not like a traditional oil field where you are developing the whole field at one time. You're really just sort of sticking 
little pinpricks into the topography of uh, you know the western the western Dakotas. It's not like a tar sands operation in which you sink all of this steel in the ground first, you know, over a five to six year engineering project. And then you try to get paid back for the steel that you've sunk in the ground. This is more of um, an incremental. It's more of like an inch-by-inch inch incremental uh, project in the Bakken. So what it looks to me, Chris, is that if price goes below sufficient levels, and I currently put that, you know, if price goes below 80 80 to $75 a barrel for any length of time, we'll just lose supply much more quickly. I just don't think the market has got its head around the fact, or I don't think the economy or, or Wall Street has gotten its head around the fact that this that that a good chunk of our supply now is ready to go offline at the moment that at the moment that price drops. And that's that's probably why price has been so sustainably high, because the global futures market for oil realizes the oil that you see now costs a lot more. So it's not going to be willing to sell you oil two years from now at 70 or $75 a barrel. It knows that the only way that 70 or $75 barrel oil is, is available two years from now is if we're back into a deep recession. And I mean a deep recession, not a mild recession. As we've seen already, these little mild recession fluctuations don't drop the price of oil anymore either, do they? Well, no, but I, I, I think when when you're printing eighty five billion a month out of one central bank out of many, uh, it, it's it's hard to get prices to give you good signals, but but low signals is certainly not something they're they're well suited for in that environment. Well, as we look forward, then as you look forward, what do you see playing out in in the oil space if the marginal cost of new production is supporting the price of oil and it, and it would take a monster recession to to dent that. Are you basically forecasting um, steady oil prices and rising, or where do you see this going? Well, my, my general view is that every year that goes by now, the bottom for oil prices gets sturdier and sturdier. And so we've reached a point where the bottom of oil prices now is, is very sturdy. And you you would need a at the very least, a combination of an increase in supply with a fairly pronounced drop-off in demand in order to get prices down, you know, below $80 a barrel, say, for like six months, you know, just for, for six months. I do think that we're always at risk for, for that happening. If we, if we go into recession, you could see that as the first response um, to entering a new recession. And again, this would just go on for, you know, six to nine, uh, six to nine months. On the upside, there's some problems with getting oil to all time new higher prices soon as well, because again, the economy remains either stressed or restrained, however you want to think about that. It's probably some combination of both, mm -hmm. because the world's in energy transition, and it's still in the process of trying to digest the oil shock, which has occurred over the past decade. And it's going to take more years to digest that oil shock. And the economy is not ready to see oil reprice a second time, as it did the first time, to say levels at $150 a barrel or $200 a barrel. Global economy is not ready not ready for that. So we're sort of in this perma restraint. And I think that that's the, you know, the, the base case is we're, we're restrained and we're stressed and we're, we're plodding along, you know, sort of incrementally in the, in the economy. And the downside risk is limited and the upside risk is, is limited. Barring a new economic shock, which sends the global economy, uh, downward. When the global economy would be ready to reprice oil to a much higher price, we'd have to we'd have to somehow go back into some higher rate of growth, which I just don't see as is possible right right now. As you and I have discussed, too much debt levels, um, even this transition to the global power grid, which I've been writing about, it's encouraging, but it's just it's not the kind of thing that gives you that fast rate economy. You know, I've said this a lot of times, and I know you agree with this, Chris, that that oil age, that liquid BTU age, that was 
That was the sexy, fast economy age. That's what gives you that hyper economy, not just a, a robust, strong economy, but just a really fast moving economy. Transitioning to the power grid, you know, sustainable, but just doesn't give you the kinds of abilities to set, accelerate and have big high rates of growth that the world enjoyed in the last century. Interesting. So uh, restrained and stressed, it, it sounds like um, we're stuck in a, in a band for a period of time until something else comes along. I've been, for a while, I thought the international community would have to recognize peak oil as a real thing. Of course, an extraordinary meme lately in the press that the theory of peak oil is dead and all sorts of other crazy talk uh, as if as if marginal increases in supply somehow um, uh, got you around the idea of depletion of a finite resource. I never understood how you could uh, juxtapose those. But there they are, fully juxtaposed in, in modern press. Do you, do you see a point in time when the international community will say, hey, wait a minute, uh, this is real, uh, depletion is an actual fact of life, and we are now going to have to figure out how to manage this? Uh, is that an open conversation you ever think we're having? Because we already know governments and militaries have had this conversation, but it is a culture, nationally, globally. Do we get well, there? We're, yeah, we're already failing at having the conversation about slow growth. Rob Arnott, who's an institutional investor in Southern California, Jerry McGrantham, another institutional investor, they're talking about a decade of 1% growth. That message has been treated with hostility, mm -hmm. with disdain, uh, with uh, haughty dismissal. Yep. Uh, hasn't been laughed at, but people are uh, angry about it. Yeah. Uh, Robert Gordon at uh, Northwestern University looking at uh, several hundred years of uh, industrial uh, revolution and growth in the West. Again, uh, not, happily, um, not happily received. So when you ask me, will people, will the culture accept peak oil, I think the culture may be uh, intuiting, its intuitive powers may be uh, more prescient and, and more spot on than we might give it credit for. Hmm. I think the culture absolutely understands that peak oil equals either the end of fast growth or the end of, of growth or the beginning of a stage of, of sluggish, stagnant growth. And I think the culture, you know, knows this grudgingly, but just doesn't want to know it consciously, you know, would be the psychological uh, therapeutic interpretation. So, you know, it's yeah. going to be ready to accept both of these concepts at the same time, you know, when it's ready. And we see some, some you know, there's some encouragement that there's some, some mar more marginal, you know, acceptance of these things, Chris. You know, I've spent a lot of time on the Internet the last decade and what I see now in the comment sections of mainstream, you know, publications, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you people have never heard of. They understand that we have probably moved into an era of slow growth, that it's probably because oil is no longer cheap. Yes, there are new sources of energy supply. Yes, we'll new, use those newer sources of energy supply, but they just won't. They they just won't give us the uh, price and power. Uh, type of combination that oil that oil gave us, and that it's pretty obvious what that spells for the econ for the long run uh, growth rate of the economy. Well, if uh, from from your lips to the rest of the world's ears, I I, I note that uh, the finance world has not quite gotten its pricing ideas around slow growth and and what that would really entail. We're still pricing our assets as if uh, rapid resumption to high growth is in the cards, and if it's not. Well, that's where I think we'll see some uh, fairly significant repricing events as we go forward. So with that, I, th I think you just did a great articulation and summary before. So we're out of time, and I'm going to close with that. But, Gregor, this has been fa just wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, it was great to chat with you, Chris, and I'll speak with you soon. Fantastic. I sure hope so.